ready? We're in a series called Passionate. Passionate. Is anybody in here passionate about sports? A couple sports fans. Anybody in here passionate about their kids? Yeah. We notice here at Family Church, if we let the kids come on stage and do like a play or let them sing, even if they're absolutely horrible, parents are like, that's my kid! Passionate about our kids, right? We're, we're, we're studying um, this idea of passion, and we looked at this story last week of a man named Jonathan. Jonathan is the son of King Saul, and he's with his armor bearer. They're camped out. They're going to attack. They're going to go pick a fight, and they're in this area where there's a cliff on either side. They have the muddy cliff or the thorny cliff, and it's kind of like that in our lives when we're trying to make decisions. There's the one side that could be slippery and hard to get footing and get traction. And then there's the other side. We're trying to make advances in life and move on and it feels like it's painful at every step. And Jonathan's there. He says, listen, man, we need to go, we need to go pick this fight. And his armor bearer says this to him in 1 Samuel 14, 7. His armor bearer says, do all that you have in mind. Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. Go ahead, do all that's in your heart. I am with you, heart and soul. My first question for you today is this. Who do you have in your life that you know is with you, heart and soul? Heart and soul. Do you have a friend, do you have somebody in your life who is like, Yo, man, I'm in. Whatever you're doing, I'm in. We are friends. We're best friends. I'm with you. Let's go, heart and soul. And as I was thinking about that statement, I began to think of our relationship with God. Are we with God, heart and soul? If God were to ask us to do something, would we say, God, whatever it is, I am with you, heart and soul. Here's what I know. Put this up on the screen. We love God in response to what we think and how we feel about God. We love God in response to what we think and how we feel about God. I'm going to circle back to that and explain it later, but let's... Move on for now. Let me ask you this, and we'll do it like a raise of hands. Are you the kind of person, when someone asks you a question, you say, I think, or are you the person who says, I feel? So I think, I thinkers. I think, I feel. How many of you are both? Sometimes I say I think, sometimes I say I feel. It depends how I feel. (laughs) So you're probably a feeler, not so much a thinker, right? Or you're a thinker, you're just an overthinker. You're even overthinking it right now. (laughs) See, but certain situations, it depends on who I'm talking to. Okay. I think, I feel. I'm very careful when when I talk about God and I think I feel something. I'm very careful how I articulate that to people. It's easy to use God as a way to manipulate people. It is. So a lot of times I say, I think God is saying something to me. Or I may say, I feel God is saying something to me. I may use those terms, right? In Mark 12.30, I was thinking about this idea. In Mark 12.30, Jesus quotes a portion of the Shema prayer He's actually quoting Deuteronomy 6.4 when he says this, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. That's a whole lot. That's a whole lot. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love God. Love God this much. Love the God with with all your mind. This word mind, and if I say this wrong, 
Brother Vincent will correct me on this one. The word mind is the Greek word dianoia. Dianoia. And this idea of loving God with your mind, or, or this word dianoia, goes beyond just rational, scientific explanation. But it emphasizes, listen, meditation and reflection. Meditation and reflection. It's actually the word that Plato would use uh, when he was talking about a mathematical equation. That he just didn't try to figure out how to do the equation, but he wanted to understand what made up the equation. Let me explain. I feel today a lot of our education that we get is simply to pass a test at the end of the week. And I don't believe that our students fully understand why they would ever use this mathematical equation. What would the purpose of this thing, what's a real life example that I would use x2 times y3 equal, like why would I use something like that, right? As a kid, my parents would buy me uh, remote control cars for Christmas. By the end of the day, I would have that remote control car in pieces, thousands of pieces, all over the floor with my toolkit out and my mom and dad walking back, what are you doing? We just bought you this thing. I want to see how it works. I want to see how the motor is mounted and then how the gears make the wheels move and the servos that make the steering. I got to see, I need to understand what makes this thing work. And I think a lot of times in Christianity, we don't do that. We simply hear somebody say a sermon. We do our religious duty of coming to a church service. But we don't get into it to figure out why. Why did I need this sermon today? Why do I need this scripture? And he says, meditating upon it and reflecting upon it in order to get an understanding beyond just the answer. I hope I'm making sense today. The depth of reasoning that this is talking about is understanding both sides of the matter, both rational and spiritual. What are both sides of this matter? I think about this when it comes to Christianity. If we're wrong, if everything we believe about Christianity is wrong, it's really of no consequence. Oops, sorry, messed up. If an atheist is wrong, eternity's at stake. Eternity's at stake, right? So, so then we begin there, we have to look at both sides of this matter. So he's saying, love the Lord your God with all your mind. Understanding both sides of this. Understand your responsibility and understand God's responsibility. Every time we read a verse, what's God's part to play and what's my part to play? When I pray over somebody for healing, I'm going to be honest with you. Many times I will pray this, Lord, as this individual does everything they can do in the natural, you do what they cannot do in the supernatural. Listen, you got lung disease? Stop smoking! It ain't that hard. Right? It ain't that hard. I ain't picking on nobody. I'm just saying. You want to come up and God heal you, but you still keep doing the same dumb thing. We got to be we got to look at both sides. What's my responsibility? What's God's responsibility, right? He says, "So love the Lord your God with all your dianoia, with all your meditation and reflection." So, I'm going to throw this out. Do you meditate on the word of God? Do you meditate on the word of God? So, I'm going to give you an example. This is what I do when I'm going to uh, preach on a scripture. This is exactly what I do. Let's just look at John 3.16 because it's a very popular one. I'll take a verse and I'll read it to myself like this. For God so loved the world he gave his only son. For God so loved 
the world he gave his only son. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Every single time I said that, I said it three times, all three times it has a different meaning. It has a different meaning to it. Simply by emphasizing one of those words, for God so loved me. His side, my side. Love you, buddy, whoever that was. I needed, I needed some motivation there. Are you, are you taking a scripture, are you taking something that you feel or think God is saying to you, and are you meditating upon it? Are you chewing upon that, that word throughout the day? What are both sides of this? Am I seeing this clearly? Okay. Then there's this other word, the word heart. So we're talking about heart and soul, heart and mind. The Greek word is cardia, cardia. It's where we get the word cardio, cardiovascular, doing cardio. It's the desires or affections in our innermost being. Desires and affections in our innermost being. We just had Valentine's Day. Hopefully, if you're married, there is somebody in your life that you love with your corazón. Right? I mean, it just sounds better in Spanish than it does English. Gentlemen, you say this, mi corazón. <laughs> say that to your girl, mi corazón. My heart. You're my heart. Like it means something. It just sounds nice. Right? Mi corazón. That's not like, I think you're cool. Not like, I think you look good. That's like, with my innermost being, you're my heart. In my innermost being, I'm connected to you. In my innermost being, I'm sitting next to you and I can feel you even though I'm not touching you. Mi corazón. Mi cardia. My heart. And this is what is this, the sense behind this. To love God with our mind and to love God with our heart. To love him with the intellect, the understanding. I'm rationally reasoning both sides of this. Not just mentally reasoning, but I'm reasoning it spiritually. And then I feel God in my life. I'm connected to him in a real and living way. And believe it or not, the Old Testament did not have a way of separating thinking from feeling. The old Hebrew language didn't have words to separate thinking from feeling. It just was kind of one. It wasn't until the New Testament came about that we were able to separate both sides. He says that we are to uh, worship God in spirit and in truth. And many times he shows that there's two sides to this. There's the mental side and there's the emotional side. The heart or the soul is the center of a person. Okay? We must love God. That's what the Bible says. Love God with all your passions, with all your emotions, with all your thoughts, and all your intellect. He's saying that we are to love God with our entire being. So I'm going to throw out a question. You don't have to answer it. Just, just to meditate upon. Do you have a passion for the Lord? Do you love God with all your heart and with all your soul? It's easy, it's easy to emphasize one part of loving God over the other, though. Because some of us are thinkers and some of us are full of emotion. Okay? Some of us, we're thinkers and emotions don't come easy. Right? I've got to understand this. There's others who you wear your emotions on your sleeve. Someone just looks at you, hey, how you doing today? Yeah. <laughs> you saw me. <laughs> there are people who they come to church and they're very emotional and they 
neglect wise counsel. They neglect making wise decisions. Everything's so spiritual, they're no earthly good. Right? So there's both sides to this. But God gave every person both thought and passions. Every Christian is to live a life that is whole and complete, not fragmented. It's not one or the other. That's the idea behind Coram Deo, the idea that we're speaking about throughout the whole year. The word Coram Deo is the Latin phrase for before the eyes of God or in the presence of God, that we are to live our lives in the presence of God for the honor of God. To understand that he is with us always, even to the very end. And, and our culture hasn't helped this fragmented lifestyle. We've been taught to fragment between thinking and emotion. To, to compartmentalize thinking and feeling. And we can either neglect one or we try to categorize certain parts of our lives. And we try to categorize who can have access to certain parts of our life. It's as if we have circles of friendships and, well, you're a level one friend and you're a level two friend and you could possibly be a level three friend and each of you has different access points. To my, and the reason why you built all of that is because at some point you got hurt. You got hurt. And we take that hurt that we've experienced from humans and we say, God must be the same way. God must be the same way. We do this, okay? So let me give you an example. Someone might think religion is about feelings and it isn't rational like science class or a mathematic equation. If, if they could just give me factual proof, then I could believe in what they're saying. Christianity is just a crutch. People who are emotionally unstable. And this leaves skeptics holding to a view of Christianity that lacks knowledge. And it's all about feelings and no fact. People might believe that religious claims are neither factual in nature nor subject to uh, rational evaluation. They believe that all belief outside scientific fact is false. And so if you're an intellectual, you understood what I just said. If you're not, you're like, what's this boy even talking about right now? Right? Because we have both sides. I saw the biggest split in church several years ago when the worship movement came out. When Hillsong and uh, Integrity Music and Hosanna Music and all this, when, when they came out really with, uh, this whole worship movement came out. And people would go to church services and worship for like three hours. Three hours. And the, the music's playing, they're like, oh, and they're crying and they're all in worship. But there was no preaching. There's no preaching. There was all this feeling and all this emotion of singing all this worship, but they had no word. Then you had churches that were all word, precept upon, line upon line, precept upon precept. But they were only reaching people who were already Christians and make them smarter Christians. And there was this divide. It was like one side or the other. But God didn't tell us to live on one side or the other. Man, I could go political right there, couldn't I? I'm not going to. I'm not going to. We'll skip that right now. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. He didn't say pick one side or the other. Well, Pastor Mike, that's just not who I am. I am a intellect. No, 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 no. It is no longer I that live but Christ that live in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. 
You have been created in the image and the likeness of God. He says, you have been fearfully and wonderfully made. Therefore, honor your God with your life. He says, what you are, what you are is a child of God, a saint of God, who is to love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, and with all their strength. Loving God with only emotion is unbalanced. Loving God with only intellect is unbalanced, right? Being all worship, unbalanced. Being all word, unbalanced. It's like my stool here. I love this stool. It's my favorite stool. But my stool has a problem. It only got two legs. Does anybody want to come stand on top of this stool for me? Dave, yeah, come on, Dave. Go for it, bud. I want you to stand right on top of this thing, right? It's lean one side or the other. This thing can't stand. It's not stable being one or the other, only having two sides. This has to have four legs or it won't stand, right? Unstable. Unstable. That stool is useless. It's unbalanced and it's dangerous. When God has your all, this is so good. When God has your all, he has a balanced product. When God has your all, he has a balanced product. First service didn't get that. That's, that's fresh for you, all right? Here's the balance in loving God with all your heart and all your soul. Ready? In order for you to love God the way he desires, you must first understand he loves you. In order for you to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, you must first understand that he loves you. I think that one is easier to intellectually understand than it is to live out. Because if it ever crosses your mind, if it ever crosses your mind that you're experiencing something bad because of God, then you don't understand he loves you. Then you still don't get it. You still don't get it. Because what did we say? Put this back up on the screen. We love God in response to what we think and how we feel about him. If you think that God is an old man with a white beard sitting on a throne with a lightning bolt in his hand waiting for you to mess up so he can strike you, you are never going to love him. You are never going to run to him in time of trouble. You're going to hide. You're going to hide. Oh. Come on, it's how you view God. It's how you think and how you feel about All right. I'm going to do a series coming up called Convicted. Convicted. It's going to look like prison. Love it. I'm excited about it. Can you tell? I'm passionate about it. If you think, if you think that every time you do something bad, that God is making you feel bad, you're not going to run to him in a troubled time. It's the, it's the greatest tool of the enemy is to make you think that when you feel bad, it's God. It's the greatest tool of the enemy. The greatest tool of the enemy. Because when you... If, I, if my mother said this to me, if my mom said when I was growing up, you just wait till your father gets home. Come on, has that ever happened to anybody up in here? Wait till your father gets home. Which really meant, so the reason why my mom would say that is if she spanked me and I laughed, oh, you wait for your father to get home, which means you're going to get spanked even worse. Can I tell you something for real? When my dad walked in the door, I wasn't looking for him. I wasn't running to him, Dad, you're the greatest dad in the whole world. I love you. 
I was like, yo, dad's home. <laughs> Running, hiding, putting four pairs of underwear on. <laughs> it didn't want me to be in his presence thinking I was about to get punished. You will love God in response to what you think and how you feel about God. If you feel that every time you make a mistake, God negates your salvation, you'll love him in response to that belief. So your love for God would be conditional upon your ability to behave. All right, I know, I know. This happens to be one of our cultural values at, at the church here for our staff. We have four values. The first one's love God, love others, make it better, have a great attitude. Have an excellent attitude. Those are four staff values. Love God. But I have to actually teach our staff about loving God. I have to teach them about loving God. And I'll ask them, do you love God? Yes, I love God. I'll say, okay, how do you love God? What do you mean? What do you mean how do I love God? Well, tell me how you love God. I love God. I say, okay, how much time in the week do you spend with him? Huh? What do you mean? How much time in the week do you spend with him? I'm not understanding your question. Okay. Would you admit that you married somebody because you love them? Huh? Do you remember the days before you married them that you were like writing their name all over your notebook? And you wrote your first name with their last name in different type of signature to see what it looked like. Do you remember being on the phone? You hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you. No, let's just fall asleep together on the phone. Huh? Somebody. But for some reason, we don't think that that would equate to how we should feel about God. I just can't get enough to spend time with God. I just can't talk to him enough. How much time do you spend with God? All right? So the first question is, if you love God, you spend time with God. Second B, if you love God, you talk to him. You would talk to him. We call that prayer. We're not talking about this kind of prayer. We're just talking about, yo, God, what's up, man? I need some help today. I got to make a decision. I don't know what to do. I really could use a knowing. I could use an answer. Am I supposed to make this decision or not? Now, if you don't think that sounded like prayer, you haven't spent enough time with God yet. Uh, God don't speak King James. God speaks Mike McKelvey. He speaks Joe McKelvey. He speaks your language. All right, all right, all right, all right. If you love God, you'll read his word. That's his way of speaking to you. This can't be a one-sided conversation. It can't be you doing all the talking. He needs to speak to you, right? And so we do that by reading the Bible. So then I just throw it out there again. Do you love God? And at that, someone who's interviewing for a job, they kind of look at me. Yeah, I love God. Okay, so if you love God, what would that look like? What would, no, I'm just saying, what would that look like? No, I, I need you to tell me, what would that look like? It would look like me maybe waking up a few minutes early to spend time with him. It would look like me turning off CNN and Fox News in my car, maybe turning on a worship song. It would look like during my lunch break, I pull out a devotional or I pull out a Bible verse that I'm thinking about, I'm meditating on throughout the day. That's what it would look like. So just to simply say, I love God, but no action. You don't. And you just need to be honest, with it. I don't. Jesus asked Peter, so we're going to talk about this next week. Pe Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter was fronting. He was fronting, okay? Anyway, love is action, not words. But here's the flip side. And this is where I have to spend most of my time when I talk to the staff. 
do you believe God loves you? Because we can't do the first. We can't love God until we believe he loves us. And you cannot say, I believe God loves me when. No, no, no. End it. God loves me. End. If you can't say that, God loves me when I'm behaving. God loves me when I'm sober. God loves me when I'm nice. God loves me when I'm not angry. No, no, no. God loves you just the way you are. He loves you just the way you are. He loves you just the way you are. Do you believe God loves you? See, you can't work at this church if you don't believe God loves you. Because if you don't really believe God loves you, if you just want to be the one who's talking about how much you love God, you're going to hurt somebody. Don't believe me? John 13, 21. We'll close with this. This is the Last Supper. Jesus is sitting there with his disciples. He's about to reveal who's going to betray him. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another. No, it ain't me. It ain't me. It ain't me. Look at each other. Who is it? Look at each other, right? Who's going to betray him? At a loss to know which one of them he meant. One of them. The disciple whom Jesus loved. So obviously he only loved one of them. The disciple whom Jesus loved was reclining next to Jesus. He, had, he was on the back legs of his chair. Simon Peter motioned to him, to that disciple. Yo, ask him who it is. Ask him which one he means. Now the one whom Jesus loved leans back against Jesus. Yo, Jay. <laughs> which one is it? Which one's going to do it? It's the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the oil or I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Okay? So let's just break this down. First of all, which one of the disciples is the one that Jesus loved? The one who's writing the story, right? He's talking about himself. The one who's writing the story, John. I'm the, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loves. Where is he sitting? Right next to Jesus. Where is Peter sitting? The one who says, ask him, motion, ask him who it is. Where is Peter sitting? Most theologians believe he's sitting at the other head of the table. That Jesus is at one head of the table and that Peter's all the way at the other end. Peter's the one who brags. I love Jesus more than everyone. I would never deny him. I would kill for him. I cut someone's ear off for him. The one who brags the most about how much they love God sat at the end of the table. The one who bragged, Jesus loves me. He loves me. He cares about me. He's the one leaning against Jesus. You will love God in response to what you think and how you feel about God. If you think it's all about your works that actually pushes you from God, when you know it's all about His work and His love for me and that I wouldn't be anything without God, that brings me to a place of dependency and close proximity to Him. You gotta see it, it's right there in the story. It's right there. I cannot love God until I soulfully and fully believe that he loves me. Unconditionally 
loves me. Agape loves me. That there's nothing I can do to change the fact that he is madly in love with me. Heart and soul. He feels his love for me. And he consciously made a decision. God consciously made a decision to love me. And he knows my whole story. He he knows my whole story before he loved me. He knew my beginning. He knew my end. He knew all my mess ups in between. He knew what I would turn out to be. He knew when I would turn on him. And he still said, I love you. And in my case, he still says, I called you. And I anointed you. And I chose you. With all the hurts, habits, hang ups. It's you. And it's you. And it's you. And it's you. We could brag all day. We could brag all day about how much we do for God. After all I've done for you. Or we could say, after all you've done for me, how could I not love you with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and all my strength? John 3.16 tells us, for God... Put this up on the screen. I got to tell you how I say it. For God so loved me. For God so loved me that he gave his only son. That if I would believe in him, I would not perish in eternal damnation, but live in everlasting life. You see, until you make the gospel personal, personal, meditating upon it in your innermost being, you will not live the passionately fulfilled life. Maybe you're here today and you've never had that opportunity to make a connection with God. Maybe you're in here today and you'd be like, you know what, you're right. By all means, I actually don't love God. I I don't love God. I have come to church. I have visited church. Maybe you're watching online and you're just... test driving church we're talking about a passionately fulfilled life you need the life of God inside of you to have that kind of life and we want to offer that to you today if you're here and you've never made a connection with God you've never trusted in him heart and soul we would love to pray with you today and at family church we pray this prayer all together that goes like this dear God I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.